Amen. And if God will lift us up to the point where we can see vision, then our hearts must be broken to the level that things that are not, are not supposed to be there will be eliminated. The thing my God not is. The appreciation of the godly virtues define a true Christian. The thing my God not is. And you know them, the thing my God not is. And if you must see vision, the thing my God does is must be eliminated. They must be taken away. The thing my God does is. The thing my God does is. What are they in your heart? What are they in your life? What are they in your life experiences? What are they in the night? What are they in the day? The thing my God does is. The spotless sanctity. Sanctified by divine love. The thing my God not eat. The thing my God not eat. The thing my God not eat. In Jesus' name, we pray. Almighty Father, we thank you because of bringing us to this retreat. We appreciate you because you love us so much. And Lord, you want us to see vision. But before we can see vision, you know we must be pure. We must be clean. Because just as all Lord, my Father, holiness, all Lord, is coming from you that is pure. Vision, all Lord, is com- also coming from you that is pure. Father, we ask that all of the spotless t- sanctity will be ours in Jesus' name. Oh, we desire that our heart be made pure. We desire that our heart be made clean. We desire that all oh everything about our eyes, our ear, everything that we enhance all oh the seeing and retaining and pursuing vision. Lord, you make clean in Jesus' name. We pray you speak to us directly from the true room. Give us the right posture of heart. We thank you because you know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Praise the Lord. Now, if you check your program sheet at the back, you see the topic we are looking at this morning. And just as our leaders have told us, the art preparation is very, very important if we must get anything in this retreat. If God must do anything, then the art must be prepared. And that's why, you know, everything we are talking about, vision, 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 because without vision, we can't achieve anything. Without vision, we can't go far. Without vision, there is nothing we can do. And that's why we must see vision. But if we must see vision, you think about it. The vessel that God will use, the vessel that God will use, that God will input and implant and impart vision, must be clean and pure vision. And must be clean and pure vessel. That's why we're looking at the topic, sanctification. The dawn of the heavenly vision. Sanctification. The dawn of the heavenly vision. You must understand that is the starting point. If you are not sanctified, even when you will see vision, the vision will be limited. Even when you see something from God, you think about it. God is holy. Angels are holy. Everything about him is holy. Heaven is holy. Now, in fact, the Bible said men that wrote the scripture, they were only men. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. They saw something. They wrote something. And that means if we, today, we must evangelize our campus, we must, you know, see things that belong to the heavenlies. Things that belong to God, we must be pure. We must be clean. Yes, we have, talk, we have spoken about Isaiah. He had been preaching. He had been posting. He needed to see greater vision. The vision of the Messiah. He needed to see greater vision. Vision that we accommodate. In fact, things that are far. Imagine. There are 66 books in Isaiah. And he, in fact, there are 60. Because it was in chapter 6. He began to see this. He began, in fact, he experienced the cleansing. He experienced the purging. He experienced the, the, the perfection that enabled him to see visions that were written in 66, 60 chapters. And then it is very, very important. As we did not see that vision, maybe his ministry would have ended in chapter 5. And that is good. what God, God wants to tell us. That if we must see this heavenly vision we are talking about, we must be made pure. Look at it in Isaiah chapter 6. Sanctification. The dawn of the heavenly vision. In Isaiah chapter 6. From verse 1. Isaiah chapter 6. In verse 1. 
in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a, upon a throne. I am lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above this stood the seraphim, each one has six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe, woe is unto me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a life call in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who shall go for us? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. You know, see, you see, you see, you see how, the, how the vision ended. But as for us, God will not release him. God will not commission him. God will not call him until he show him the holiness of God. And why was God showing him his own? So that he can see his own depravity. So that he can see his own, lim- his, his own limits. So that he can see that <clears throat> if I must see heavenly vision, and if I must do something for God, if I must see greater vision, I must see something about myself. When he saw the Lord, and the train of the God's glory filled the temple, he saw everything about God, he saw holiness. From the, from the time of God's end, Seeds in the seven, he, he, he carried out in the story. He said, I am undone. Who is me? I am undone because I am a man of unclean leaves. He recognized himself, he knew himself. He was not hiding anything from God that he knew of himself. He said, I'm a man of unclean leaves. He said, Why? Because I dwell in the midst of unclean leaves. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And when he acknowledged that immediately, you know, if you can acknowledge the state of your heart, immediately God will do something about you. If you can acknowledge the state, the condition of your heart, the thing that go on in your heart that will not allow you to that will not allow you to see heavenly vision, because there is a connection between your eyes, what you see, and what you can retain in your eye and your heart. And you must know something. Every part of our life must be sanctified, must be clean, because some eyes, some eyes are not clean. Some years we are told in art are not circumcised. Mind and art, everything is not clean. And therefore, if we must get heavenly vision, or if we must, be, if we, if we must, if we must even work for God, if we must run with heavenly vision, our life must be clean. Look at it in Psalm, in Psalm 51. Look at the confession of David in Psalm 51, from verse 7. And this thing is always true. Before God can commission us, we must be sanctified. In Psalm 51, in verse 7, Purge me with ifso, and I shall be clean. He said, Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou art broken may rejoice. I thy face from my sins, and blot out my tra- iniquity. He said, Create in me a clean heart. Imagine that. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. There are two things you must put in your heart. Number one is sanctification. Number two is the heavenly vision. You see, the summary of the heavenly vision is the complete deliverance of soul from the bondage of sin and Satan. But the first soul on the list of those that must be saved is the soul of the, is, is the soul of the soul winner. A soul that must not be lost. You see, the vision of the state. Of the soul winner or of the soul winner soul is therefore the most important revelation that must be sought and settled. Sanctification, which is a complete deliverance from sin, is the essence of seeking to know the state of our soul. The state of the soul winner soul. Why? Because it is possible for somebody to be running and is running himself to ruin. It's possible for somebody to be running with a supposed vision and is running himself to rejection. It is possible for someone to be running with the supposed vision of winning the campus community, of winning, doing everything possible to ensure that other people come to the, to the side of the Savior. And yet, the man in himself became, became a castaway at the end of the day. Look at how Paul expressed it in 1 Corinthians in chapter 9. And why? Why is, do we need the revelation 
of the state of the soul of the soul winner because it is possible for him to run himself to ruin if he does not take care of that aspect of his life in first corinthians in chapter 9 in verse 26 and 27 i therefore so run and then that's a man that has seen vision not as uncertainly so fight i not as one that beat the air you know you run because you have seen something you run because you are pursuing something. He said, but I keep under my body. That's where the sanctification comes in. But I keep under my and I bring it under subjection. You know, sanctification is the control of the Holy Ghost over the affairs of your heart. Making it clean. Making it pure. Also maintaining it so that you can become useful in the hand of the Lord. He said, I, but I keep under my body. I bring it under subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a what? You will not be a castaway. The only thing that will not make you to be a castaway is that you are sanctified before you begin to run with heavenly vision. And that is very, very important that the revelation of the state of the soul, the soul winner, must be ascertained, must be sought, and must be settled. Sanctification is the second work of grace, whereby a saved individual is truly and thoroughly cleansed from inbred sin, inbred tendency, from the self life. You know, the, 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 the bedrock of all sin is self. And if you're not talking about sanctification, you're talking about the expulsion, the purging, the cleansing, the purifying of the heart from the self life. It's the thing that puts self in, in the fall. Things that put self at the, first, at the first place. Things that make self to take preeminence over the affairs of your life, over your decision, over the places you go, over your determination, over your dominion, over everything about you. Things that you do in your life, that place, that place self at the premium of the affair of your life are things that are expunged, that are cleansed, that are taken away as sanctification. Sanctification is for those who have become born again. I will call it the second work of grace. We have the inbred tendency, the tendency to commit sin. Yes, I'm not committing visible sin. Yes, I'm not lying again. Yes, I'm not fighting again. But the tendency exists. Because in the moment you commit that sin, you have become a sinner, you are not born again. But the tendency now exists. The tendency, the tendency to, 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 to be disobedient. The tendency to lust. The tendency, the, the tendency to abuse. The tendency to do anything that, 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 will, that will degrade other people. The tendency to, 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 to commit the sin that, that God himself ate. When those tendencies exist, it's an indication that that act needs the purging or the second touch. You must understand that when we become sanctified, we are truly free and kept for the master use. In fact, one of the definitions of sanctification is restricting a vessel for only use. Restricting or limiting the use of a vessel for God. And if God must use us, and if God must, he must first impart in us the heavenly vision. But if he must use us, we must be clean vessels. What, what does sanctification do, does? Sanctification, number one, brings divine love for God and man. Number two, sanctification brings deliverance from inbred sin. Inbred tendency, inward sin, things that you know, things that make that degrade you in the heart. Yes, you may see you sing in the choir. Yes, you may see you preach like myself. Yes, you may see you dressed and garbed in Christian clothing as we as as we, as we, as we already divine it. But yet the heart is degenerate. The heart is depraved. The tendency of the heart, if God just open our eyes to see it, in fact, the heart is gone far from perfection. And there is a mathematical parallelism with the, with, with, with the lifestyle of Satan. And the Lord is not telling us if we must achieve or we must get heavenly vision, sanctification is the dawn of, the, of heavenly vision. And we must possess it. We must cry for it. We must quest for it. We must request for it. Sanctification brings divine law for God. There is no other way you can have divine law. For you to obey the first commandment, your heart must be circumcised. There is no way you can do it. By your own power, you can love God the way He wants to be. He, he wants you. He wants us to love Him. He said we should love Him with all our heart, with all our might, with all our energy, with all our strength, with everything. You think about it. Naturally, can a man do, can a man do that? He cannot. And therefore, we need the sanctification, the circumcision of the heart, for us to love God the way He wants us to love Him. Sanctification brings divine love for God and man. Sanctification brings deliverance from inbred sin, inward sin. Sanctification brings definite usefulness. If you are not sanctified, your usefulness will be limited. There are some revelations God will not give you because you can't accommodate it. 
There are some things God will not show you. There are some labor God will not take you to. Sanctification brings definite usefulness. Sanctification brings divine nature. Makes you to partake of the divine nature. And those things are many. Divine nature. Partake of divine nature. There are a number of words that are used for sanctification. Number one, we have the circumcision of art. That brings to your mind operation. There is another one, perfection. There is another one, holiness. But our holiness is very, very common that we must need to analyze it. If you write the word holiness vertically, the H in holiness, humility. Look at the book claim that they are sanctified, but they are not humble. You know, it is possible to be humble outwardly, but you are standing, you are bending, but you are standing in your heart. The eye of sin. You know, there is a sin in the plural. There is the sin in the singular. And it's for the sin in the singular. If you read Isaiah chapter 6 very well, that was taken away, that was poured. That was cleansed in the life of Isaiah. Yes, the eye is seen. It's still standing. You are not humble. You are not bent. The earth in holiness. If you say you are holy, there is that humility. No, but the, uh, the old, there is the obedience. Unquestionable obedience. Or they call you obedience. Coordinators call you obedience. You know, these are different. You now have yardstick to the people we obey. All rep, we don't obey them. Central executive, we don't obey them. The only person I want to obey is the coordinator. And you're obeying them because you know if I don't obey them, the wrath of God will fall upon my life. You're not holy. Obedience should cut across everywhere. Obedience in holiness. The L is love. And we're talking about agape love. The genuine kind of love. Love without laws. That we can interact with in love. That we can, you know, we can interact and discuss in love. That I will discuss with my sister. I will not have evil thing in my heart. I will discuss with my brother and sister. I will not have evil thing in my heart. I will not be lost in. Because of his causes. Because of the cause he's doing. I will not be lost in. Because of whatever, whatever privilege the person, the perceived privilege, you have already considered or you have seen the life of that person. You will not lost over people. Love. The eye is integrity. In holiness, how can we say we are holy and the integrity is not there? It's somebody divine integrity as Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever, always constant. You come to meet him in January, he's holy. You come February, he's holy. At every time, consistency and faithfulness, and the end there is new arts. How can you say you are holy? You don't have new arts. He said, A new art also will I give unto you. A new also, a new art also in the new year. A new life, a new character. He is eternal fitness for heaven. You know what we say? We are holy. We have eternal fitness. You are fit. God wants me. Let God come in the night. You are fit for heaven. Let God come in the day. You are fit for heaven. Let God come when you are in the bus. You are fit for heaven. Let God come when you are sleeping. You are fit for heaven. When you say you are holy, may God rot holiness in our hearts. And make sure we can be eternally fit for heaven. You know, some people, they are fit for heaven on Sunday. But the moment Sunday passes, on Monday, they are not fit. And what will betide them if God come on Monday? What will betide them if God come on Tuesday? And we come on Wednesday again, they cry again, God, God. And they waste it. They waste the grace of holiness. We come on Thursday again, they cry and cry. When you hear them cry, you say, these are first class holiness people. But on Friday, they have lost the experience. On Sunday again, they get the experience. And such people, they might be disappointed when Christ comes. So when you say we are holy, there is eternal fitness for heaven. The earth is sincerity. Many people are not open. They are so close. And they say they are holy. Yes, they can sing about holiness. Yes, they can preach about holiness. The sincerity is not there. You know, you are living with somebody. The person does not know practically anything about you. And you say you are holy. And you say you are an executive. And you say you are a coordinator. And whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call yourself, the openness is not there. No sincerity. Sincerity talks about transparency. You are transparent. You are open. You know, people, you are accessible. People can easily assess you. You are not close up. Sincerity. Then the earth is separation from sin and the world. How can you say you are only you are not separating from sin? You are not separating from the world. You are still attached with the elements of the world. You are still, you say you are holy. The element of holiness can still be found in your expression. Can still be found in your carriage. Can still be found in your character. Can still be found in your cover. In your core. You know, everything about you is a separation from sin and the world. Look at it. Sanctification is the oppression that is done in the earth. It's not oppression that is done in the end. And that's why we have many people that can say a lot of things about holiness, about sanctification, yet their heart is not clean. It's not the theology in the end, but the theology in the earth. Let's look at it in Romans, in chapter 2, verse 29. What is the object of this sanctification? Where is he wrought? In Romans, in chapter 2, verse 29. 
in, uh, Romans, sorry, in Romans chapter 2, in verse 29. Romans chapter 2, verse 29. But he is a Jew. But he is a Christian, which is one inwardly. Christianity starts from, you know, true Jews are known by their inward character. That was when Jesus Christ saw Nathaniel. He said, look at him, a man in whom there is no God, a true Jew. He said, he is a Jew, he is a Christian, which is one inwardly, for circumcision is that of the world. Circumcision is that of the world. He said, in the spirit, he said, not in the letter. The letter talks about the accumulation of knowledge. Not in good expression. Not in the letter. Accumulation of what you have read in Bible doctrine. In the 22 doctrine because you have taught it. Because you know it. Because you have access to the book. You have accumulated body of knowledge. Not in the letter. He said but what? He said but it's in the heart. Whose praise is not of man. When you accumulate letter, the praise is of man. But it's of what? But it's of God. It's only God that can identify people who are sanctified. And through our interaction, through our relating to one another, we can also identify people who are truly sanctified. And that's why we're talking about sanctification on the one hand. Heavenly vision on the other hand. Without sanctification, you can't be partaker of heavenly vision. May God open our eyes. Sanctification experience is the consequence of the operation of God in the heart. And therefore, you must submit your heart. If you want to be sanctified, you know one of the best things that God can do perfectly is sanctification. Because there is no other person in the world that can do it. That's why God commits himself to that divine art. Satan cannot do it for you. Your pastor cannot do it for you. Your parents cannot do it for you. And if you must get to heaven, you must submit your heart for this divine operation. If you don't want to get to heaven, why are you even here? If you don't want to get to heaven, why do you profess to be a Christian? If you don't want to be a Christian, you don't want to get to heaven, why are you even joining the workforce? You think about it, it's am not convenient. And look at the prices you are paying. Not convenient. And the only thing that will pay off at the end of the day is that we are sanctified. May God sanctify us. May God make our heart pure. May God cleanse our heart. There are three points. Number one, the heart vices. The heart vices. Number two, the heart victory. Number three, the heavenly vision. Number one, the heart vices. You know, vices are wicked art. But it's a strange art that emanates from the art. You know, the art is the core of man. No, number one, the art vices. Number two, the art victory. Number three, the heavenly vision. If we must say the heavenly vision, the art vices must be eliminated. The art vices, you know, you must understand something about the art. And therefore, that you know, you know, the art was divinely constructed by God. You think about it. And he's the only one that can operate on it to make it sanctified. We're talking about spiritual things here. We're not talking about physical art. We're talking about that spiritual thing. That essence. That call. That thing that makes you, that makes you a man. You look at it. In Jeremiah. Jeremiah. In chapter 17. In Jeremiah. In chapter 17. The advice in Jeremiah, in chapter 17, verse 9. He said, the art is deceitful above all things. And that's why we can sit down as angels, and when we get out here, we become another thing. The art is deceitful above all things. You know when you are you are doing like that, and you have a chameleon lifestyle, we know that your art is unregenerate. We know that you are still possessing the art of the old man. We know that you are still possessing the, the art is deceitful. You know, somebody can be deceitful in his look. Somebody can be deceitful in his apparel. Somebody can be deceitful in his character. You know, you see him hypocrite. You see him doing one particular, you know, having a particular behavior at this, at this location, another particular behavior at another location. He said the art is deceitful. Above all things, above the head knowledge, the art is deceitful. Above all academic learning, the art is deceitful. Above everything you can take off, above the spoken expression of good English, the art is deceitful. He said the art is deceitful. Above all things, above your name, the art is deceitful. Above all things, and desperately wicked. You think about it. I'm talking with my sister, and she's already lost in after me. Desperately wicked. A brother is talking with their sister, and the brother is already lost in, measuring her, looking at the contour of the body. Desperately wicked. He said, the heart is deceitful. He said, above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And that's why he said, it's only God. And that's why we must expose ourselves before God. And therefore, we must submit our heart before God. He said, who can know it? Even yourself, you don't even know the extent to which your heart is desperate towards committing sin. Until you have 
an enabling environment. That's why you now know, so I can do this, so I can say this, so I can imagine this, so I, I can do this. I left campus, and yeah, I'm a holiday, so I can do this. What do you want to think about somebody committing immorality with the brother's wife? So I can do this? That tells you the extent of the desperacy or wickedness of the heart. He said the heart is deceitful above all things. He said, who can know it? Desperately wicked. Who can know it? Until we submit that heart to God. And he performs the divine art of holiness. We can never be free from the bondage of sin. He said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. But what are these vices in the heart? In Mark chapter 9. You know, I told you the art vices. The art vices. And they do things that the art do, though they are not seen, though they are not known. <laughs> but these are the vices of the art. These are the wickedness of the art. You know, everything that man commits emanates from the art. And until the art is submitted, you know, I told you, submitted. Placed in the hand of God. And you are sincere. And you are not deceiving yourself. And you come before the Lord and say, God. Oh, my heart is deceitful. How do you know your heart is deceitful? We went on holiday. Look at the things you did. Your heart is deceitful. Yes, you know it's as if you are the utmost height of spirituality. But when we got home, look at everything that we did. Look at everything that we spoke. Look at the interaction we made. Look at the contacts we made. He said the heart is deceitful above all things. He said desperately wicked. Who can know it? Let's look at the vices of the heart. In us, in Mark chapter 7. In Mark chapter 7. In verse 21. He said, from within. Out of the way. You are not there. In Mark chapter 7, in verse 21. He said, from, from, from within. Out of the heart of men. Proceed what? Evil thoughts. Yes, I'm born again. But out of the heart, as, as, as in a fountain, proceed evil thoughts. Evil thoughts of whatever category. Evil thoughts in immorality, evil thoughts in uncleanness, evil thoughts in wickedness, evil thoughts in hatred, evil thoughts in degrading somebody, evil thoughts in bringing down somebody, evil, evil thoughts of whatever you know. The Bible says there are some people that they are filthy dreamers in Jude verse 8. In Jude in verse 8. They will be sitting like this. They have gone far in wicked thoughts. They are in the church. They have gone far in wicked thoughts. In Jude in verse 8. Evil thoughts emanate from the heart. And therefore, we must be sincere before God. If we must bear heavenly vision, we must be set free from every vice of the heart. Or every vice, every vice of the heart. You think about it in verse 8. He said, likewise, this word, fill the dreamers. Yes, you are looking at them and you are seeing the perfection of holiness. But the Bible says, yes, likewise also, these fill the dreamers. They defile the flesh. Evil thought defile the flesh. Few the dreamers, they defile the flesh. He said, Evil thought in Mark chapter 7 again. He said, From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. Proceed evil thoughts. Proceed adulteries. You may say, Ah, that, um, I'm not married yet. What about adulteries in churches? You are not here. You are here. You are not satisfied. You go to this fellowship. Go to that fellowship, adultery in that sense, in that spiritual sense. He said adultery. He said fornication. Fornication accommodates all uncleanliness. Uncleanness in Luke. Uncleanness in no masturbation. These are days when Christian and Christian workers are suffering from masturbation. They will be alone like this, they will defy themselves. Yes, I know you will cry. Yes, I know you confess, but why have you not come? And come to a definite standpoint in your life. And you come to confess yourself before God. And you are sincere and say, God, I want to be a true Christian. I, I don't want to undulate. I don't, I, I don't want to be there and here. I want to be consistent. Oh God, sanctify me. Purge me. Cleanse me. You pray to a definite Christian experience of sanctification. Of fornication. Accommodate all uncleanliness. And the Bible says all uncleanness. And it means it. All not clean and he means it. All not clean and he means it. He said fornication. He said murders. Yeah, it should be wicked for somebody who is here and committing that physical act murder. But there are also, there are some abstract murder. You are staying with a sister in the room, murder. You cut her with her, just your tongue. You cut her down or cut him down with your look. You cut him down or destroy him with your pen. 
No, you, you so much speak that is heart breaking to you. You so much speak to him, and, he, and it's as if you reduce him to a non entity, and you, 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 you kill and cut with your mouth. He's a murder. I said, Bible says, Where does it proceed from? The art. It's one of the art vices. He said, The art. He said, Tear. These are days when Christians are also stealing. I know it was strange in those times, in those days, that when you put your things in the church, very, very safe. Go and come back, you will meet it there. But these are days, somebody was complaining that uh, he put an uh, answer in uh, Angola or before prayer meeting. Before we finish prayer meeting, somebody has taken an answer away. In the church, dead. Somebody was also in a, in, a, in a close office and he slept off. Somebody came again, came in again and picked the answer and went away. Where are these things coming from? Dead. The Bible says they come from the earth. You know, your own might not have degraded to that point. But of what, of, 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 of what size? Tave. Lying to collect extra money from your parents? Tave. Physical stealing in the, in the room? Tave. The Bible says they come from within. They come from the earth. Tave. Stealing of whatever kind. Even stealing God's glory. Tave. You are preaching and you are preaching well. And people are crying. People are wailing. And people are submissive. People, it's as if they have seen God. And yet you go in the corner, you claim the glory of God. Tave. And the glory of God is no longer saved in the hands of minister. You have sung, you have led, you have led the call, you have done everything, whatever you have done. And people are blessed, everybody is rejoicing, people are happy, and yet you have stolen the glory of God. Tell of whatever kind. The Bible said, tell. He said, it emanates from the earth. The Bible now says covetousness. Covetousness of causes. We are no longer saved in the church because we are studying medicine. And somebody who is not studying medicine is covetous of us. And I've already told you that the end justified the means who has told you that somebody who has studied medicine will be better off in life. Even the Bible says it does not yet appear what we shall be. And we no longer believe in God and we feel inferior. We are covetous. Covetous of people's dresses. Covetous of people's shoes. Covetous of people's... People, you know, people, people. We are covetous of everything. The Bible says covetousness. He said it emanates from the earth. And it defiles a man. It's a covetousness. It's a wickedness. Can you imagine that? A worker? Wickedness. 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 You know, it is wickedness that you just sit down, you manufacture story, and surround somebody's life with wicked stories. Stories that are not true. Maybe you see a brother and a sister talking. You just come to conclusion, they will marry themselves. And you just, you peddle it around in the church. I say, that brother and that sister, look at them, you, they will marry themselves. That brother is that sister. You are matching them. It's a, it's a wickedness. And you, leaders are no longer safe. You know, th- th- those days, we respect our leaders. We cherish them. When we see them, it's as if these are angels of God. That these are men sent from heaven. But now, it's all hypocrisy. Somebody will see a leader, will greet the leader very well, but at the end of the day, it's, ah, that leader, <laughs> don't worry, he's studying both me. Don't, don't mind him. Look at his shoe. Everything is flat. Look at the stroller, jumping up. Look at this, look at that. Wickedness. And we caught our leaders in the secret. Wickedness. Even if it's not that they are leaders, our older people, older Christians. We caught them in the, in the secret. The Bible says wickedness. The Bible says deceit. I go, sir. But you never go. Deceit. Yet now the names are out. You go to Angola. You go to I go, sir. You never go. You never went. Deceit. Go for this, sir. Go for this program. I will come, sir. He never comes. Deceit. And when they come with their excuses, flimsy excuses, on serious excuses, and then that does not show that they will understand Christian stewardship. No flimsy excuses. He said, "Deceit. You deceive everybody. Deceit." No, this idea we are even hearing of cases that somebody will collect money from this one, collect money from this one, collect money from this one, and just elope or run away with the money. Deceit. I will come and meet you those no time. This and this and you plan everything. He never shows up. Deceit. Lasciviousness, all this surrounding uncleanness, you know, excesses of immorality, excesses of laws. <laughs> These are the when brothers are not even saved again. These are this when sisters are not even making matters good, they are making it worse. The kind of blessing they wear, huh? the brothers are not even saved in the church again. Lasciviousness. And we know what we did before, we you come to church, you are saved, but now you are no longer saved because of the way sisters dress. Even because of the way some brothers dress, opening their chairs and showing some things that will inflame lustful passion in the opposite sense. The Bible says lasciviousness, everything 
passion, ranting immorality, excess of laws, and every Bible says an evil eye. An evil eye. And you mistakenly make an eye contact with somebody, you know, this one is an evil eye, a lustful eye. The Bible says, having eyes full of adultery, that will never cease from sin, beguiling on savings or, 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 or saving soul. He said, an eye that exercise unto covetousness, he said, corset children. An evil eye. They look at you, they measure you from head to toe. They reduce you to non infinity, infinitesimal. They reduce you to nothing, an evil eye. Yet, in their, in their form, in their composure, in everything, it's as if this an angel coming from heaven. But the Bible says an evil eye. The Bible says blasphemy. They blaspheme. They are failed. They blaspheme God. How would God allow me to fail? What was God looking at? God is not kind. God is not this. They blaspheme. And the Bible says pride. Where are these things coming from? I said, where are these things coming from? Pride. Pride of the course I'm doing. I'm in mechanical engineering, so I'm proud. I'm in chemical engineering, so I'm proud. I'm in uh, whatever, whatever course we are doing, so I'm proud. Do you know, it is because we are here, those are the, that's why the things have value. Go outside there. Who, who knows whether you're a mechanical engineer? Who knows whether you're a chemical engineer? Who knows whether you study accountancy? Who knows anything about you? The value, is, the, value, the value that you can add to the community is what counts. Who knows anything about you? The Bible, the Bible says pride. All the same. Pride of the ladies. Pride of everything. Their parents are rich and they are giving them good clothing and all that. They are proud. Proud. Proud of their ability. Proud of their charisma. Proud of their knowledge. Proud of everything. Everything proud. You know anything that you have as an advantage over others. They are the means through which you can be proud. Unless you tame it. Unless you control it. Unless you allow the work of Christ to be effectively done in your life. So that you don't run yourself to pride. The Bible says the pride, the pride, the Lord ate. And the Bible, the Bible says the Lord puts them afar off. God resisted the proud, but give it grace to the humble. And that's why when you say you are truly sanctified. Humility, which is the first age in holiness. The last one, foolishness. You know, it is foolishness for somebody who is in part one thinking about marriage. Foolishness. You know, it is foolishness. Somebody who is matchmaking people in the church. Foolishness. Somebody who has left his Christian stewardship, left everything, and is now matchmaking people in the church. As a foreigner, trying to do some dubious things in the church, and trying to go behind the door, meeting sisters, settling mar mar marital issue with them. Foolishness. The Bible says, all these evil things, they are evil things, brethren. He says, all these evil things come from within. And what do they do to a man? They defile a man. He said, the list of the vices of the heart are counted. The heart of man is the core of his total being. A disease in the heart makes the old man sick before man and render him unclean, defiled, and unfit for heaven. He said, the heart is not sin, and that's why it is dangerous to have disease in that direction. See, so the presence of any of these vices render the believer a slave to sin, renders him useless in the kingdom assignment, and makes him vessel unto dishonor. These sins damn the soul and destroy our testimony of professing to be Christians. Until the heart is delivered and victorious, the hand cannot faithfully run with heavenly vision. Until our heart is delivered, and our heart can become delivered when we detain our heart in the place of prayer. Asking God to purge us. Asking God to cleanse us. Asking God to make our heart victorious. God will make our heart victorious. Point number two, the heart victory. Do you know it is possible to have victory in the heart? Victory in the heart assures victory on earth. He said, thanks be to God who causes us to triumph. Who giveth us the victory. And the victory starts from the heart. But if the victory must start from the heart, the man must be sincere. If the victory must start from the heart, the man must be open. If the victory must start from the heart, if the victory will be wrought in the heart, the man must be all and complete. You think about it in 2 Timothy. The heart victory. In 2 Timothy. In 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. In chapter 2. From verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every man that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 
But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. But if a man, remember what we read, he said, all these evil things, they come from within and they defile the man. He said, but if a man, look at the connection, therefore purge himself from these. That he recognizes he, that's his own part. No, there are two parts of sanctification. The human part and the divine part. Your own part is to recognize it. Your own part is to be, to be willing to be free. No, some people are not even willing to be free. Because of the pleasure they enjoy in meeting that sister, they are not willing to break off. Because of the pleasure they derive when they talk to her, when they touch her. I don't know what to do in, the, in darkness. He said, but if a man will pour himself from these that we have mentioned, he said, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepare unto every good work. And God has promised that if a man will do that, look at what God said he will do. In Ezekiel, in Ezekiel, in chapter 36, Ezekiel, if a man will be sincere, so much sincere, and he had observed any of these vices in his life, look at what God has promised. In Ezekiel chapter 36, in verse 25 and 26, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, amen, and ye shall be clean. And from, I say, from your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you. He said, a new heart also will I give unto you. And a new spirit will I put within you. You know, all these things come from within. See, I will now replace them. You know, you see, you must look at sanctification as something that God is displacing some things and putting in some things. That concept must be kept in your mind. God is taking away some things, all these vices we are talking about, putting in the victorious element, victorious quality that makes your life look like Christ. He said, he said, he said, he said I will put a new spirit within you. He said, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you the heart of flesh. That's the promise of God. You know, I told you there is only one singular operation that only God can do in the whole of the earth. You know, there was a revelation in the book of, in the book of Revelation. There was a book. Men had to open it. This one they gave to this one. This one cannot open it. They gave to this one. This one cannot open it. And John began to cry. But thank God Jesus Christ now came to open it. Do you know? Your heart cannot be opened up and cleansed and, dis- and, 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 and delivered if, if you don't allow God or admit God to come to do that operation. No, I cannot do it for you. Our pastor cannot do it for you. It's the only operation that God can do best. You know, there are some other, you know, the Bible says there are diversities of operation. But it is the same God that worketh all in all. Operation of gifts, giving people gifts, giving people this and you know, there are some people that give you false gifts, they teach you tongues and all that. But this one, nobody can do it. You can teach other people tongues, but you can't you can deliver their heart. You can't circumcise their heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30, Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verse 6. The heart victory. The victory of the heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 30 in verse 6. He said, and the Lord thy God is thy God. You know how did he become thy God? Because I will be a father unto them and they will be my sons. And when he became born again, he became your God. Because now ye are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. Amen. And the heart of thy seed. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. I said, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. The Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart and the heart of thy seed. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. The Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. That's the promise of God. Only hearts that are submitted on the altar of this divine operation will be worked upon. If you don't submit your assignment, the lecturer will not work on it. It's until you see yourself and you are sincere with yourself. And as you have mentioned all those vices that the Bible had mentioned, you see yourself, you say these things, they are in my life. Yes, they are redundant. Yes, they are not visible. But the tendency to exist. Like, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just only the grace of God that is keeping me. But the tendencies are there. Oh Lord, I bring my heart. This is the only operation that only you can do. I, you know, I, 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 I can't be hypocrite about it. I can't deny the fact that these things are, are, are you know, they are growing up. There was a let in any of you, an evil heart of unbelief, the seed of bitterness, coming out bitter against people because of what they have done. You are bitter against them. It's only God that can perform a divine operation that can uproot everything that has defied our heart. In Jeremiah, in chapter 4, verse 4, in Jeremiah chapter 4, in verse 4, the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed. So that you'll be able to love the Lord thy God with all your heart. Remember sanctification, the dawn 
of the heavenly vision. If the vices are not taken away, our heart cannot be victorious. And if we are not victorious, we will not have the motivation to run with heavenly vision. In Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4, he says, circumcise yourself to the Lord and take away the false king of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evils of your doing. The Lord is telling us the tenacity with which we are to do this art. The Lord is now telling us that we must, we must not be careless about this thing. The Lord is now telling us that we must not be frivolous about this thing. The Lord is not telling us that we must not be indifferent about You know, somebody can be indifferent. What are they even saying? Since I've come to this fellowship, they have been talking about sanctification. Any retreat to talk about sanctification, sanctification. But these things are true. The Bible says in Revelation, these things are true and faithful. These things are true. The evil thought is still in the heart. You know, he wants to give you victory in the heart. Once you gain victory in your heart, you can gain victory on earth. No, 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 he's not saying circumcise yourself. In Romans chapter 2, circumcision is done in the heart. It's the heart experience, a second work of grace, whereby a soul is delivered from the bondage and from the tendency, from the inbred nature, the inbred capacity of sin. In Romans, in chapter 2, we have read it before in verse, in, in, in verse 29. For he is a Jew, he is a Christian, which is one inwardly. Because everything that defiles you, they come from within. And they defile the man. But a man is a true Christian who had received a life experience of sanctification that washes away every sin that are within, the enemy within. Is the enemy that you have tempted as these vices. And the Bible is now saying, he is a Jew. It's not outward. Yes, we are partially correct. If you say Christianity is not measured by our outward appearance, maybe you are partially correct. But what goes on in the art, or what we see in the outward, is the indication of what goes on in the art. The Bible says, He is a Jew. He is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart. Circumcision is not that of the head. Circumcision is that of the heart. Circumcision is that of the earth. He said the victory of the earth lies in its complete cleansing by the blood of the Lamb. Through the operation of circumcision wrought by God himself. Here lies the believer's victory. To be freed from sin and free to serve God without spot, without wrinkle, without, see, without blemish or any of such things that the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5. Look at it. He said you want to build a glorious church, a triumphant church, a militant church. In Ephesians in chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 26. He said, he said, he said, he said, in verse 26, that in pot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is the purpose of God in this retreat. That he presents or that he buys us over. That's redemption. Our redemption is not complete without sanctification. Yeah, there is the first aspect of redemption, which is salvation. Then there is the last aspect, which is sanctification. So the maximum experience that you can get that makes you to become like God is sanctification. You know, Holy Ghost doesn't just empower you to do God's service, but it's sanctification that makes you partaker of divine nature. The Lord is now saying, He wants us to have this victory in the heart. He said, He wants us to have victory in the heart. He said, The believer do, does his own part by acknowledgement. Acknowledging the state of his heart. Acknowledging the condition of his heart. Acknowledging the activity or the experiences of his life. Looking at himself since we have resumed. What are the tendencies that I'm prone to? When I went home, what are the things that I did that I have not confessed? What are the things that are going on in my heart? Pray that I'm sitting down. What are the things I'm battling with? Masturbation, uncleanness. These are the things that emanate from the heart. And the Bible says that make a man unclean. But if any man will purge himself from this, say he shall be a vessel unto honor. He said, purify, cleanse, and meet for the master use. A believer must be what? Must come to acknowledgement. Number, number two, he must come to identification. Not only coming to acknowledge me that this is exists in my life, but it comes to identify. He was able to identify it. This one is in my life. Look at what the Bible says in Mark chapter, chapter 7. This one is in my identification. This one is in my identification. This one is in my, And you're not saying, ah, I was out this one too in the life of that person. Forget about everybody, everybody else now. Talk about yourself. Because we want you to be a heavenly vision. We want you to run with heavenly vision. You know, we have defined many, many things. Yeah, this semester is the year, is the semester of good success. And we mean it. Friendship mentorship scheme, and we mean it. 
Many other things, and we mean them. Now we say for you to run effectively and faithfully with that heavenly vision, you must be sanctified. There must be acknowledgement. There must be identification. There must be consecration. In fervent, wholehearted prayer unto God. God, when God sees this, this, He comes in this mighty power to deliver the believer from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness and empowering him to remain holy. He said, God does not only sanctify to expunge all acts vices, thus giving a heart victory, but also impart heavenly vision so that others can become partakers of his divine nature. Do you know why God has collected us and he wants to purify us because of others? And that's the content of the heavenly vision. Because of others. Because we can open other people's eyes. We can make them to see the provision of the cross. We can make them to see the provision of the gospel. But if our hearts are not cleansed, if we are not sanctified, we can't run with heavenly vision. Point number three, the heavenly vision. You know, the heavenly vision tells you that a vision coming from heaven. And until heaven is open, visions cannot come down. You know, in aspect or in matter relating to the ministry, in relating to serving God, relating to sea worship, when the heavens open, heaven can open for many reasons. Heaven can open for abundance of rain. Heaven can open for abundance of provision. But in relation to serving God, when the heavens open, two things are predominant. Number one is the voice. Number two is the vision. In Ezekiel chapter one, Ezekiel in chapter one, in Ezekiel, in chapter 1. Let's look at Ezekiel. As he was among his brethren, something happened to him. In Ezekiel chapter 1, verse 1. Now it came to pass. In the, in the 30th year, in the fourth month. You know, you know, some of these things are always definite. Remember Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah, he knew the date. When sanctification happened to you, you will know how it happened. You know, it was not there before, but in the year that King Uzziah died. In Optasia. That Beginning of the session workers retreat. You know, look at Ezekiel here. He said, No, it came to pass. He said, In the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river Keba, that the heavens were open and I saw the visions of God. Ezekiel must have been sanctified. I saw the visions of God. Because God does not show visions to unclean vessels. God does not show things that are precious to him. He said, do not give all these things unto dogs. Dogs are the people that are unclean. Those are the people that are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that are beset by uncleanliness, fornication, immorality, openly, openly, secretly, at everywhere. God will not say, do not give that which is only unto dogs. God is now, Ezekiel must have been sanctified. He said, the heavens were open, and I saw the visions of God. Now, what is the content of this vision? In Acts, in chapter 26. Acts, chapter 26. In Acts, in chapter 26, from verse 16. You know, after God has sanctified you, these are the things he will tell you, but, are, but rise. And stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, for this purpose, to make thee a minister, and a witness of these things which thou hast seen, and of the things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people, and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes. The content of the heavenly vision. And to turn them from darkness unto light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. In verse 19, whereupon, O King Agrippa, what happened? You know, you'll be disobedient to the heavenly vision if you don't have the qualification, and the qualification is sanctification. You, it will not be real to you to open their eyes. What is my concern? Let them die and go to hell. But if your heart is sanctified, you know the safe life will be gone. The safe life will be expunged. And now you can take in the same frequency with God. You know, say, God, yes, to open their eyes in alumni, to open their eyes in our, in our world, to open their eyes in fact, to open their eyes in our campus community, to open their eyes in, in, in the lecture theater, to open their eyes, my classmates, my roommate, everywhere, to open their eyes and to make them receive forgiveness of sin and an inheritance among those that are sanctified by faith. Isaiah saw the same thing after he was cleansed. And God can satisfy that sin, not sins, that sin, the body of sin. That's what the Bible tells us in Romans. The body of sin, which is represented, the body of sins, which is represented by sin. He said that sin is purged, that iniquity is taken away. After God had discovered that a total conversion, a total sanctification, a total cleansing had been done, God now gave him the commission. He now said, who are we going to sin? And that is the heavenly vision. Isaiah said, because he was now free, he was not dragging his feet again, the self-life is gone, he was now free to answer to the call of God. He said, here am I, send me. 
May the Lord give us grace to answer to that call in Jesus' name. Say, sanctify believers and necessary seers and carriers of heavenly vision. They, they have partaken of the contents of the heavenly vision. Therefore, they are called and commissioned to deliver to, deliver to others. Heavenly vision is what the campus community needs to turn back onto God. And therefore, if we must see heavenly vision, or if we have seen heavenly vision, number one, we must not be disobedient to heavenly vision. We must not deny heavenly vision. And we must not delay the heavenly vision. Men are dying. We must not delay heavenly vision. And the last one, we must not divide heavenly vision. A divided heart is not a sanctified heart. The Bible says that heart is divided. And therefore, shall they be found, shall they be found faulty? The heart vices, the heart vitri, the heavenly vision. Who can perform this operation in our life? Is the only one that can open heaven and make us see heavenly vision. It's also the only one that can circumcise our heart so that our heart is made pure. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6 again. Deuteronomy chapter 30, in the seas. It says, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thy heart. How he will do it, I don't know, but he can do it. It's a mystery. That I was lost in before, and I'm now delivered, I no longer lost. It's a mystery. You think about the mystery inherent in turning an elephant to a to 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 elephant, to elephant. The same picture that you have the tendency to fight. God change you. You become quiet. You become gentle. It's a divine art. That you have the tendency to gossip. Bend rumor among the brethren. No destroy, destroy character. Destroy people. People character people are built for a long time. You with your words, with your tongue, you destroy everything. And you bend rumor, lascivious, and all those wicked sins, all those adverts that we have mentioned. It's only God. You think about that. You say you don't even know how you can be delivered. You have committed masturbation. You are even tired. And you even know that. I you know. In the, yes, I'm going. You, you, in fact, sometimes this is why some of us are even in the church. We don't want because we know. You mean I get home, I will do it again. I don't even want to go again. You think about it. I go now, turn you around. You now walk upon you, and you are set free. It's a divine art. And until you experience it, you can't appreciate it. Until you experience it, you can't know what I'm saying. Until you experience it, you will not be there. That you are free. That you can relate and laugh with people without evil, without loss, without anything. He said, the Lord thy God is our God. He said, he has the power to promise, he has the power to perform. He said, the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart, thy heart. This heart that is defiling, this heart that is destructive, this heart that is desperately wicked. He said, this very heart, the Lord thy God, will circumcise thine own heart, thy own heart. He said, and the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all your heart. You know, if you don't get this circumcision of heart, even the first commandment, you are failed. What was the first commandment? You love the Lord thy God. You are failed. Tell me what is the assurance of getting to heaven? What is the assurance of partaking of divine nature? What is the assurance of making heaven at last? Even the first commandment, the first commandment, you have even broken it. It's until God circumcises our heart. And cleanses us every week. We can appreciate what the power of God can do. Let's be on our feet as we go to the Lord in prayers. The team my God dot eight. Is that the Lord that God will circumcise thine heart? This very heart, the Lord that God will circumcise thine heart. This very heart, the Lord that God will circumcise thine heart. This very heart, the Lord that God will circumcise thine heart. And the heart of thy seed. So that you love the Lord, they go with all your sanctification. The dawn of heavenly vision. We can't see heavenly vision. You can't carry heavenly vision if your heart is impure. If your heart is not cleansed. If your heart is not washed. All oh, sanctification. All oh, the second work of grace.